looking to create um, something that isn't a traditional print casebook. It's not a replacement for a casebook, it's a casebook supplement. It's a faculty initiated project. Whoa, okay, I'm losing my mouse. All right, it's a faculty initiated project because of the limitations of casebooks and the time involved in everything. One of our faculty came to us just when his casebook was about to be published and said, my topic is energy economics and the environment. It's going to be out of date as soon as it's published, and I've been working on this for a long time. So there are some topics in the law, obviously, that are changing all the time, and the limitation of print is a huge problem for students. Um, there are other things that are basic limitations, like what kind of illustrations you can include in multimedia and things like that. We have been working on this project, like I mentioned, over the last year since that casebook came out, and we showed it to a group of students in his class, and we had a universally positive response. It was a very small group of students, but one of them actually told me, every casebook should have one of these sites. It's amazing. I want it. Of course, their expectations may be based on the idea of updating it like all the time with all of their research they would ever need, <laughs> um, which, you know, there's the limit to what faculty members can provide, but in general, they do like this. Um, and we really thought that having one of these websites serves a gap in showing what faculty are doing all the time and keeping up to date. When they're publishing a casebook, it's on a topic that they're an expert in, and that kind of expertise isn't always proven in their other publications and the things that they're doing in terms of connecting with other faculty members in their subject area or reading things in the news and just knowing how these things all connect and how they connect on a topic. That's what they do with a casebook. Having a website where they can update this easily highlights that in a way that can be really good for the school. Um, and the other reason we like this is, despite saying that we worked on this for over a year, it really has been in bits and pieces a week here, a week there, look at it and see what I make my student workers do. Um, so it's a one-time setup, and we've provided a lot of training materials that we can hand off to you guys to use, customize as you want to. So what is it? A casebook supplement site, like I mentioned. Um, what would it include? Updates such as new reg legislation or regulations, corrections if illustrations have gotten out of date in the textbook because they're based on old data, um, or additions such as more illustrations. You could have lots of different content. You could have videos. You can have slideshows. Um, you could have interactive maps and graphs and things like that. Connecting with more students. One of the things that's a little bit challenging with something like this is you you have this idea of you can set it up and technically any student who uses the casebook has the link to the supplement site that we set up, not this one, but the actual one, um, and they could find it and use it. Finding a way to connect to all the faculty members and all the students everywhere that are using the casebook isn't something that's easy to do. We got sign off from the publishers to go ahead and set up the site. They were like, we're not doing it. We don't care if you do. Um, but actually connecting with the people who have purchased your product is not something that we're in the line of communication to do. And the broader audience, um, especially like I mentioned, the first one we set up was for energy, economics, and the environment. And that's a topic that students um, are taking lots of different classes where they might be studying just one part of that huge topic that the casebook covers. So you could have a broader group of students who might not pick up the whole casebook but do want to see what your expertise is, um, connect with other faculty, practitioners in related fields. I have a friend working in um, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and she saw that there was a section on nuclear power and said, I would go to the site and check it out. So practitioners may find something that's updated by faculty who have that kind of context valuable. Um, and going beyond the casebook, a lot of the conversations we've had here have been talking about things like ebook chapters. Um, do we want to create something that's interactive? It's based on WordPress, which is traditionally blogging software. You could have comments enabled. That's a management issue in time that I don't know that very many faculty have the time to check who's commenting on their casebook supplement site. But if you had a desire to do that, you could have more interactive things. On this site, I turned on something that's a question and answer plugin that Elmer installed on the Classcaster. So you could do something like that that's a little bit more managed, like you know, somebody asks a question, do you want to spend the time answering it? Um, okay, so who is involved in this project? We have two faculty members at Chicago Kent, um, Professor Fred Bosselman and Professor Dan Tarlock. Both have case books that they wanted to set up sites like this. Um, over the last semester, we hired a law student, Rishi, who 
worked with the faculty members to research new updates, input things, find files that they already had, and put in all the information that they didn't want to bother to look up because they just knew it. Um, we're able to hire international students from our main campus computer science department. So um, Jayu wrote three plugins for me that we then put out on WordPress. I'll get into what that means in a little bit. But the nice thing is something that we wanted to have enabled for our website. WordPress is an open source thing that you can download things freely, you can upload things freely. We put those out there through him and they've been downloaded thousands of times for other types of sites. So it's good to know that working on a project like this, we can be part of a larger helping each other kind of project. And then this is our group. Um, so Debbie's right there, I'm here, and we have other student workers and staff who've been helping out on it. So the content comes from the professors, the design came from us, and the customization. I came up with the ideas and our student workers did most of the programming. I cannot say that I'm a PHP expert. I have enough of an idea of what it can do <laughs> um, to ask them. So WordPress. How many people here have actually ever used a WordPress site, blog, anything? So most of you have at least seen it, whether you actually keep up a WordPress blog on WordPress.com or whether you've logged in to update some other site that's running Word on WordPress. Um, Hopefully, you'll agree with me that it's a pretty user-friendly site. Um, one of the things we really liked is you can do things like lock it down by user type. So I could set up the site as an admin and then give the professor a certain level of control and then the student worker an even lesser level of control if the professor wanted to say, yeah, go ahead and do all the work, but I don't, I'm not sure I want you publishing anything. <laughs> I'll check it before it goes online. Um, so different people can have different roles like that. It's a really quick setup as long as your server is configured for it. We're lucky that we have access to our server, our IT um, staff really support us in that. And so the basic things you need are all open source applications. It can work on different types of servers, but if you don't have access to your own servers and can't install it yourself, use Classcaster. Um, flexible organization, I'll get into what that means, but that was the number one reason why we used WordPress. They wanted something that would be easy to match online to the book. And so the number one organization for the book is the table of contents. So what we did was we set up a table of contents automatically that then the students just check off where it falls as they add an update. Oh, this is in chapter one, section A. Click, publish, it's in there. They go to the table of contents, click on it, all the things in chapter one, section A show up. Um, and then easy to back up and transfer. Our professors who are leading the charge on this, some of them are retiring and there may be other authors that are, you know, as they retire and retire from the field as well, they may not be that on that list of authors anymore and this may need to move somewhere else. Um, WordPress has pretty good backup and transfer options that we could send all the content to another place if it ends up being something that we're not updating anymore, but someone else wants to. So, basic features. Um, if you've been exposed to WordPress before, you might think, oh, blogs, why would I want to use something like that? It's all new content all the time at the top. Um, they have two different types of basic content called pages, which are like an ordinary website where it's fixed content. Usually it's the only thing showing on the page. Posts, you can have a list of posts or you can have an individual one. Um, we use the page option to set that as the front page and that turns into our table of contents. Flexible organization, categories have hierarchy, so that was the most important thing so that we could say chapter one, section A, section B, section D, you know, and section C has three subsections and whatever, and uh, we did a lot of work to make that automatic, so that's really helpful, I think. <laughs> Post tags can be used to do anything else you want to do if you want to organize based on content. If you're adding a lot of video and you want people to be able to view all the videos, then you add a tag to each post that you add a video and it goes up. You can click on that and show them all at once. Um, and the custom menu, as you can see up here, has a couple different things there. I could add links to other websites if I wanted to. I could add links to specific sections and I can change that without having to know any code. So it's actually pretty easy to hand off to people who know. They know how the website should look. They don't want to know any code. That's okay. They don't really have to. Dynamic design means that the way the site looks is totally separated from the content. So we designed a theme and that's what I'm using on this website. Um, it's loaded in Classcaster. People would just have to check it off. Uh, widgets are things that you can add to the sidebar like this, where it has like an outline of what I'm talking about, different links and so forth. If you've used blogs, you've probably seen stuff show up in the sidebar. You know, some people have 
Twitter feeds or something like that. Um, depending on what you think your users are going to need, you can do different options that are built in. Um, and page templates are something that's a little bit more advanced. Some of them are really basic. It's like full width. Okay, I just want this one page that I'm creating not to have a sidebar. I select that and I'm done. Um, some of them are a little bit more in-depth, so we've created things like, uh, let me just open up this page. This is an automatic page. If I went in to edit this page, this is what the page editor looks like, but there's actually nothing here. And all it says is the template is archives, so that's something that we built into our theme that automatically goes to the categories I've put in this um, setup. And it has this expanding option. It has links where I've added it to go to the RSS or email, which I'll talk about in a little bit, too. So you can do some fairly advanced things with the design. Um, and hopefully, we've done a lot of the things you would want already. Um, I can't promise to support any site that you set up, but I can promise that this site will be here. And I hope that we can use it kind of as a forum for ideas. Um, subscription options. Like I showed, there's those little icons there, um, orange and green. Um, that's for RSS feeds are the orange ones, and email are the green ones. And RSS comes built into every WordPress site because it's blogging. RSS is for easy um, subscription options. I went ahead and put the Wikipedia quote there. Um, so if you look at, this is the URL from the website I'm working on here, emilybarney.classcaster.net. If I add slash feed after pretty much anything, it will show up as an RSS feed. That can be really nice if you have a very complex um, table of contents, and maybe people only want to follow one chapter, because their class is only using like two chapters out of the whole book. They, don't, they want to sign up for updates, but they don't want to get everything from all 20 chapters. So that means that you can add a category feed. Um, I recommend using Google's feed burner service to organize these and do more with them. Um, let me see if this will open correctly. This is, okay, this is automatically powered by feed burner now. So the content shows up as pictures. It doesn't load as a bunch of weird code that other people can't recognize. You can see sometimes the formatting isn't quite the same. Um, but that brings up everything that was in my background category there. Whoops, where am I? Here we go. Um, the other great thing about FeedBurner is people can now subscribe on their own to email. RSS readers are a great idea, but not every student and not every person who comes to the website is going to bother to set up an RSS reader, enter all that information, and then use it. If they do primarily get information by email, FeedBurner offers a free service that will take an RSS link, and you go through a little process, and I've created a handout that anybody can hand off to someone to say, go take all my links and put them in FeedBurner and give me back the new FeedBurner links. Um, and you can do this email thing. Again, with our kind of advanced page template that we set up that I showed earlier, um, we have something so that if, the, if you put in that FeedBurner link that you get back, if you've enabled email, um, it automatically shows up here. So we've created an archive that'll check for email subscriptions on FeedBurner and add icons across the site. So something like this now goes to email subscription requests for the whole site. And I didn't have to do any hand coding. I have a plugin, then I'll talk about that in a little bit, um, that I had a student set up to do that. So I wouldn't have to do a lot of thinking or where does that link go? And oh, I just switched everything. Where do I put it? So like I mentioned, we hire amazing student workers, and I'm really happy to have access to them. Um, and that's where the bulk of our work has gone, is to customizing this to make it easy for the rest of you. Um, so here is an example of the theme. As you can see, I'm actually using it on this site. It looks about the same. Um, creating a child theme of your own. It can be as simple as using a CSS style sheet if you have something that you like the format of another site, but you just want to tweak the colors or something. Um, you can The WordPress codex is where they have all of the documentation about the way that their site is set up and how to edit it. And a lot of the pages do have examples. So if you have a question, the forums and their own documentation, a lot of times will lead you through it, even if you don't really know that much about PHP. Um, if you're really comfortable with PHP, like our student workers, then you can add a lot. But I'm not going to get into that, because that's not my expertise. I'll just say that plugins, again, like I mentioned, are the things that the student workers add. And I'll show you actually what they look like on the back end in a moment. 
page templates, like I mentioned, the archives by chapter, that's the one I've been showing you that has the little icons and the, you can expand it and all that kind of functionality. A simpler one might be um, we have an automatic table of contents that pulls from those categories and creates it as a nicely formatted list with all the indents and so forth. So we put those in in one step. We set up a page template and then as soon as you enable that page template, it goes and it looks for that information that you've added and it reformats it on the front page so you don't have to do any of this hand coding like, oh, how do I indent this and double check that I've entered it the same everywhere. No, it's all grabbing it from one place. So that makes it easier to manage the whole site. Um, let me go back home here. I've put a lot of detail into this. If you're not familiar with WordPress at all, and a lot of people here have played with it at least a little bit, so I'm not going to go into these, but under WordPress basic features here, I put a few explanations for what these things are, so you can go ahead and click on those and see what that is. Um, all right, so actual setup. What do you need first? A table of contents, if you're going to set it up the way that we have, and I'll go at this point and show you um, if you go to, uh, let's see, and because we've, like I mentioned, we've been working on this over a period of time, this one actually doesn't have all the same features that I've just shown you on the Classcaster site. We're going to be working on inserting all of them. Um, so, like this one has the gradient on the side and so forth, it's on a slightly different set up. Um, but the URL is supplements.kentlaw.edu slash energy law casebook. And I'll put a link onto my site in a moment, but I'm just giving you a preview of what we want it to look like. So it has the site title, it has a subtitle, it has a picture of the book, it has a list of the authors, it shows the most recent updates. Um, this table of contents was one we hand coded, so that's why it's got a few things like highlighting on it. Um, that just I found that to be more labor intensive than necessary, so that's why I tried to work with some of the other page templates, like I mentioned, that can automatically load. Um, but you can see he's got a lot of content to cover here. Um, even if we just stay, sorry if I'm making anybody dizzy, if we stay up at the top and you just see the range of topics that are included in this casebook, it's very, very broad. Um, so it's got all these nice options. How did we get that table of contents in? Well. First of all, we had to get an accurate electronic copy of the table of contents. That would have been horrible to hand type. I would have found somebody else to do it. Uh, but we were lucky that, like I mentioned, the publisher was very hands-off about this. Oh, you want to do this? That sounds great. I don't care. Here's a file. So we just had to make sure we got the very latest one because the book was still in pre-publication at that point, and you don't want to have to go back and make a lot of edits to something that's that detailed. Um, I went ahead and I put up a handout here that's a couple pages long and it's very detailed because I assume this might be something that you want to hand off to somebody else. <laughs> so this would be the sort of thing that a faculty administrative assistant could follow step by step. Um, if you're starting with a PDF, what does it look like when you paste it? You get a whole bunch of gobbledygook in. Okay, how do you clean it up? How do you deal with, um, and I have some extra features. I like playing with Word to do some of this stuff because I know there's probably advanced tools out there, but I figured I'd use something that pretty much everybody has, and I'll write very specific instructions, and then you guys can hand this off or follow it. If you have continuing questions, you have my contact information, but hopefully this has all the information you need. And basically what you want to do is get it down to, and I did some stuff, you want it to look something like this in order to import it. Chapter 1, Introduction, that's the top level. The next one is chapter one introduction slash the importance of energy. And so it goes down the line. And so each one that's a subheading has the heading above it on one side and the chapter thing on the side. So if you've got text, I did a couple things with find replace and then playing around with tables to drag and drop the titles for the ones above it. Um, but anyhow, once you get to this kind of text, that's where it gets really easy. We had to hand enter all this stuff. Um, what I have now instead is a plugin that shows up under the post things called category import and all you do is you paste that block of text in here and click add categories and it automatically adds all of them in the correct hierarchy. Um, this was something that I had my student worker create. It didn't exist before. He put it up online and like I mentioned it's been downloaded over a thousand times because other people want to do something with categories and they don't want to have to enter them all by hand. 
So, you have your table of contents now. It's done. You know, I found I went through that original table of contents to see how long it would take, and it was like a... It was under 10 pages, but it was really detailed, and I wanted to make sure I didn't lose any of the information, or especially because I was getting it from a PDF. So it did take me a couple hours to review it very carefully. But again, you're doing it one time. Header options. So this is what I was going to show you. My casebook looks, or my website looks a little bit different than this one. This one has all this stuff at the top. How do we set that up? Well, this is an internal link here. But I had my student workers create a settings page, and it looks a little bit messy because we're still working on it, and when I get updates, I'll send them to Elmer, and it'll look pretty again. But I want to add a picture. Okay, I found a picture. Um, I want to show links, and I will choose certain types of... I've added a... Oh, well, that got loud. I've added a filter so that I can choose which updates show up in that recently updated section. Um, this shows anything that I've added as a tag as I went through it. I could simplify that by only using one tag for featured if I didn't want to mess around. Um, and I will add a block of text and save changes. And I do not need autocomplete. We'll go back to the website. And if this is working correctly, and I, I gave Elmer all this code at the very last minute, so there might be some things I need to work on, but you can see the recent updates showed up. I'm having an issue with the picture and the link, so, and block of text showed up, so I'm not sure exactly why those broke, but um, normally we do have them working on our local site, so I'll work on that. But that was one of the things we wanted to do was add settings pages that let people um, who don't know how to go into a WordPress PHP header file and add links to images on their surface or, you know, let's say you're setting it up as a casebook site and the casebook cover changes and you want to upload an image, you don't want to have to mess around with code, you just want to upload it. Um, and then one of the other features that you can see was important to the professor here was actually having the exact pages associated with the table of contents. Um, we had to type all of that in by hand, and it was a pain in the neck. So what I have instead is something called display description that shows up there. And then I also had the student worker create another um, tool here where I choose that I want to update descriptions for categories, and then I could go in, and I'm not showing on categorized, but I could say this is, um, I started with this. So this is section one. And this is section two. Uh, they're not displaying in the order I want, but that's because I'm creating this kind of haphazardly. So whatever, I update it. And then for my website, just like the archives page had a, um, let me see, a page template that did that automatically. We also have one here called auto table of contents, so I'll just say auto and publish it. You can see how easy it is to add content. Okay, so this looks a little silly at the moment because I haven't formatted it correctly, but you can see that the sections that I added from the description show up, and that's the sort of thing that if I went to um, wanted to do something different than page numbers, having that description there. I've used that on other sites to do things like show images and links and stuff like that. So if you're doing a casebook site and you're not doing it associated with a print book, you don't need page numbers. Maybe you're doing it with the Langdell chapters. Um, you could put the links to the EPUB volumes right there and have it display at the top of this list under chapter one. Here's the link. It always shows up there and all the updates show up underneath it. So you can do things like that with kind of built-in fields in um, WordPress fairly easily. It's not something I've enabled here because it's not something that we're using with our sites, but I'm just putting it out there that that's a possibility. If somebody else wants to do that, I can give them some suggestions. So I'll go back to the front page. And talked about that. Um, I also mentioned that feed burner. I put in some instructions here for how to set up a feed burner thing where you're taking your your links, whatever they are. That's an example of 
um, the site I've been working on, and you paste them in and create new ones. And then again, we created a plugin in order to enter these. This site looks a little crazy because I've been playing around with it, but I can change it to only show categories. So I've added that um, at the background, I've added a category thing. If you had, let me go to one of our um, test sites. show you what this looks like. So here's an archives page where we've set up feed burner links doing the you know the PDF that I had that opened up here shows how to you know you go here and you look for this menu thing. It's a copy and paste kind of thing that takes you know, depending on how many chapters you have to do, not that long. Um, but it's a one time setup. You put it into the feed burner thing for each chapter, you put the link for feed burner and then it'll draw for things like an RSS link just for that chapter. Um, this is a site that we haven't entered a lot of content yet, but we're working on it. Um, okay, so I've shown you a couple of the things that are on the back end. Those plugins are things that you have to, um, if you're using a Classcaster site, you just have to go into installed ones and activate them because, like I mentioned, I gave them to Elmer and he installed them already. Um, if you notice things are weird with them, um, you can let me know, but I can't do a lot of support for this. Um, hopefully it's something that we can kind of collaborate on as there's more people interested in doing projects like this. So, um, But what can you provide for your faculty? Well, one thing I did when I was setting up other WordPress type sites for faculty members is I just gave them a one-page handout. Um, if I'm giving this to them and they don't want to have to do the administration, I mean, Classcaster makes this really easy, but still, they just want to tell you, um, okay, maybe they're going to publish it in their textbook and they need to know what the URL is. You're going to have to work with your IT people probably if you need to have it on your own domain. Um, that was something that we worked with, but I just give it back to them. This is your username. This is your password. Um, here's your site title. Yes, you have an image of your book. Yes, you have links to the author's profiles, things like that. So something like this could be a useful tool to get it set up quickly for communication. Um, style guide. This is something that I first set up as a long print guide, and that ended up being a little unwieldy. It was fine for a student worker who was doing a lot of the work because he was like, oh, I'm learning stuff. This is awesome. When I handed it to the professor, he was like, this is a lot. I don't think I'm going to do it. Um, so we found a really nice... Um, plug in again that adds a section for help that you can build into the website. So if it's not something they're going to spend a lot of time, you know, keeping that piece of paper with them when they're, especially in the summer, traveling around and they notice something in the news, they want to add it, but they don't want to have to think about how to add it. Um, we've put some information in here that have examples for why you would want a short title <laughs> because our faculty members like to give us basically the entire post as the title and I need to explain like that's not how people want to read anything. Um, explaining what a permalink is, why you would want to keep that short too. Um, so things like that, I've tried to write some illustrations that explain what is going on in the different sections. Like here's what your button will look like and here's where you can draw it and here's the other things. Um, I haven't finished converting all of the things from the long handout that I gave the student into the help documents, and I also haven't figured out how to export the help documents, but I would like to work on that, so if there's more people doing sites like this, maybe that's something we can collaborate on, how to write the instructions in a way that makes sense for faculty at different places. Um, and I think I already showed you that there's feed burner setup instructions. So, Additional features, like I mentioned, this could have comments. That's pretty easy. You could have content filters by using tags and then just linking to those tags like we do for the categories. Like this says category background. If I say tag, um, I haven't built it in. Oh, actually, you know what? I'll just make a change on the fly because so I can do that. Um, I'm going to change my sidebar to include a tag cloud. All right, now you can see all of my tags. Um, if I was doing this for a casebook supplement site, I wouldn't put so many in. I would only use the ones probably that were useful. On the other hand, if you don't want to have it display on the side, then you could use as many as you want. Adding tags like this can help with searching. So if I said something like theme, then it pulls up all of them. If I wanted, so this might be something that's under customizing and under basic things. Um, 
you could have tags that pull stuff from across different categories, put it that way. So it would be much more helpful if you're doing it by content format. For instance, all the news articles that people want to see what's going on in the news or recent regulation or videos or whatever. You can use tags to do a lot of different types of things and then you have a link that's permanent that you can put out there that gets updated every time you add content. So that's useful. Um, let's see. I mentioned, uh, let's see, ask questions is right here. So you guys, I'm the editor, so I can do that. I could ask a question. What would you and I haven't put in a body all right well there are other features that you can add and I'm not going to play with that one right now because I haven't really poked at it too much um, and like I mentioned hosting ebooks would be pretty easy adding links to things like that I've already hosted as you saw a number of PDFs and things like that pretty quickly um, so where to get started well one thing you can do, and I will add it to my sidebar since it didn't show up in my header. All right. Save. You can go to Classcaster, and you can click on Create a Blog, and sign in with your Cali ID, and you will have a blog. And then you just go into your site set up, just like my dashboard here, I went into my appearance and I searched, for, let's say I searched for, oh, I don't know why that doesn't work on the search, but anyhow, it's on page six. Oh, I, I had number lock on. There we go. Okay. Oh, it's not showing up because I have it enabled. Let me switch to something else. I forget these things are so dynamic that they don't make sense when you're trying to show somebody else how to do it from the start. All right. You would just go down, and you could see this one is there. Whatever one you have activated doesn't matter. You just go in and you say, activate it. And then that is now your site design. Um, and then the plugins, the same kind of thing. You go into the plugins list, and it'll show some that are inactive and some that are active. I've enabled all of the ones that I wanted to use. I've listed them by name on my website in case you can't remember which one was used for what. I put that information into the instructions for the setup. Um, and then I played with some other ones. Um, if you want to show somebody kind of the things that I just showed you in a really short version, I have, uh, I, oh, nope, not that. Facebook supplement slide, slides here. We did a very short version of this presentation um, for Harvard's faculty services thing, and we kind of showed why and what did we need and how did we do it, and then we have a few screenshots of the setup. So if you want to show the site to somebody else and see if they'd be interested, those slides hopefully would be quick. And that's list, that link is right there at the top. Do you want a short version of my website? Um, so, down at the bottom, install your own on Classcaster. When can you do this? Anytime. I will put my actual files. If there are people who want to do their own WordPress installations and host this themselves, I can put my theme files and links to all of that stuff up on this website. Um, eventually, we'd like to put our theme up in the WordPress.org theme gallery, but we have a few tweaks to do. As you saw, the header isn't loading correctly. Um, and we would love to collaborate with other people. We really think that this is the sort of project that is a fairly simple concept, but suits a real need um, for some faculty who, you know, they may not be interested in blogging. Blogging can be a way of saying, oh, look, I'm really keeping up with everything. Here's what I noticed in the news, and here's why it matters. But not everybody wants to sit down and write why it matters, because that's hard. It takes a lot of time. You can talk about how easy it is to set up a blog, but it's not easy to keep it updated. Um, something where you're just posting and let me go to one of, oh, uh, one of our sites 
Got too many things open here. Uh, one of our sites and show you what kinds of things actually get posted. So here's a summary. I got that from the professor. Again, he does like long titles. Um, and then what we decided to do in our style guide is ask that we put out every bit of the source instead of putting blue book citation or something like that. Citations serve a purpose, but they don't really serve a web purpose. Um, if the link dies, you can't really blue book citation for law journals and so forth. It's not something a search engine is going to recognize. So we decided to put everything out in full titles, including the full URL, um, all the information about the issue, and then if something breaks along the way, if you've put the update, you've put the information about where it was at the time. It's not something that I think is worth spending a lot of time going back and updating these things, but if you put enough information, hopefully the information is somewhere else. And you know, if it's a law journal, maybe the Chicago Kent Law Review um, URL changes, but somebody could still find the Chicago Kent Law Review articles by searching for them with you know, the title of it and so forth. So that's what an actual individual update looks like there. On the other site that we're working on, this professor teaches in water resource management. It's not as broad a field. And what he really wanted to do, because it's not changing all the time, I mean, there are definitely changes in water um, laws around the world, but what he really wanted to do was include illustrations that he uses in his PowerPoints in class and link to that. Now that becomes somewhat of an issue because people who use illustrations in class aren't necessarily thinking of that as publication if you are embedding other people's content. And that's part of why in that last post when we were linking to an article, we just put a summary. We did not repost the article. That might be something that some students would like if they didn't actually have to do any searching. They could just find it. But that's that can be violating copyright and publication agreements and so forth. Um, so for this, um, here's an image. We're trying. This is still in test mode because we're trying to make sure we actually deal with the idea of hosting images in a way that's not violating the photographer's copyright. Um, the professor may have had these things for 20 years and downloaded them off of a website somewhere and stuck them in a PowerPoint. And at that point, it's not likely to come up, but it could if you're going out and just grabbing other people's illustrations. Um, one thing I did for that issue with um, the other website when I was getting it set up um, for instance there is this da, 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 da. this is taking a little bit to load um, there was an article talking about things in the Camisia Bach 88 in Peru and I thought this is going to be kind of opaque to a lot of people who haven't kept up with that particular news story, so I wanted to put in a link to a map. And what I did was I did a thumbnail that then linked to a site that had more information. Um, and, you know, my map may have disappeared at some point. I know there were some things that linked to larger maps. But just doing that kind of thumbnail image, I think, is safer in terms of copyright. That's what Google does to link to things. And people don't seem to have as much of a problem with it. So if you're using small quality <laughs> images, um, just to link to external content, you can do that. Um, the other thing that I um, did was sometimes I wanted to use illustrations. And for instance, in this one, I found a great illustration on Flickr. So I have been encouraging the student worker and the faculty member to think about using Creative Commons images that they can get for free as long as they do something like, say, who the photo's by and link back to it. So uh, this was originally set to link back to the Flickr page. And at some point, it's not working. So there's always things to play with. One reason I decided to change this whole theme was my header stuff was all showing up in the sidebar in a way I really don't like. So I think our new de theme design will work better when we have it polished to perfection. Um, in the meantime, it does work for the basics. So any questions or suggestions for how we can use this? Or things you wish that an ideal casebook website would do. <laughs> yes. Oh, um, sorry, I gave that at the beginning of the. It's um, emilybarney.classcaster.net 
is what I was using to give my presentation here. Yeah. And then I'll put the links to all of these things on the um, session page on the Kelly website. Um, so, um, Susan, we're you the person who gave the um, Ignite speech, is this handling any of the things that you were thinking about? <laughs> Right. Right. I mean, but if we work with Elmer. <laughs> uh, anybody else? Oh, sure. Sure. Right, how it shows up. Yeah, um, no, again, this theme is one that I'm moving away from, so some of the details of how this shows up with, like, the little arrows next to the tags and stuff like that will probably change. Um, like I mentioned, the design in WordPress is totally separate from the content, so I'm not going to lose any content, but the way it's laid out may change. Um, so these are the different updates that have been added. Some of them have icons included. I really encourage them to do the small little thumbnails next to things because I thought that made it a lot easier to remember what you've just looked at. Um, oh, I, I saw this one already. I don't need to go there. And you can see other reasons why I don't want to use that layout. Um, so, yeah. And I tried to set some basic ideas. By We did end up, when we were first setting up the site, the professor sent us a list of links. And then we ended up trying to figure out how we wanted the post formatted and doing all the inputting ourselves. So that was, again, the other part of the effort. But that's by doing that, that's how we wrote our style guides. And then we were able to hand it off to a student. And I didn't have to do anything for months until the student graduated. Uh, but <laughs> the professor's really interested in learning how to do this himself. And if we work at it, with our instructions and figuring out what the things are that are the barriers for the student, he would just poke at it, you know, like, oh, I'll go look at an example and I'll just copy what they did there and it'll be fine. And he could kind of understand this button does this and it looks kind of like Word. The professor's looking at it and saying, I don't see it immediately. I'm just going to ignore that section. <laughs> so sometimes I was going back and making a few tweaks to his post to make it make a little bit more sense. And then when I did that, I would go back and change my instructions to make it a little easier to figure out. Um, but, you know, it's a process. Did you get a chance to show the back end of how a simple an update is? Oh, sure. Um, I showed updating a page, but one of the things I really like about the new version of WordPress is when you're logged in, you have this toolbar across the top. So as I'm working on my presentation, if I want to add a new post, I click on post. Um, I've got my categories set up here, but if I was doing this on um, this, uh, this actual supplement site, let's say, um, sometimes the login works, not sure why not. And that's the other thing. There's no software required to do this. Um, you can do it from anywhere. So, you know, a faculty member who's traveling and is on vacation, WordPress offers kind of clunky um, mobile interfaces, but there are ways to do that or to set it up so that you can email WordPress and it will display as a post. So things like that are possible if people really don't want, if they want to update it, but they don't want to have to go to the website. Um, Okay, and I can also, I'm the admin, so I see a lot of stuff, but if I see that there's stuff that I'm not using and it gets in my way, WordPress also lets me do things like clean up the screen really quickly so I don't have to look at things anymore. All right, so I'll add a new post, and, I, and it tells you right away when you log in, enter title here. <laughs> so there's some things I don't bother with the instructions. Title. And uh, when I go into the categories, then here's the list of categories that are already entered. And when we first set up 
the original supplement site, we only added the first two levels of categories for the table of contents, chapter and then A, B, C, D. We didn't add all the rest because we were adding them by hand and it would take too long when there's five pages of that sort of thing to enter. With the new copy and paste sort of function, we could if we wanted to have it as granular as the table of contents is. And, you know, it makes it a little bit unwieldy here, but as long as you're matching it up to the textbook. I mean, the student who was doing the updates had it next to him. The faculty member could look at this and say, yes, this is a part of, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that I don't know what I'm talking about with um, water rights management. But, um, you know, you can go down and check off just one thing. And things like adding an image go under here, like set a featured image. So if they were doing something like there's five images in the um, posts, they could choose which one they wanted to be the thumbnail. Um, there's also something called a media library that when you add things like thumbnails, you can use them over and over because it saves them and it's got this interface. So if I wanted to add something like the EPA logo, I can look at it. I can change the name. Um, I worked on that quite a bit on the first one. Um, doing things like standardizing how the images were added so that the professor, if he wants to, can just you know, look up all the agency logos that relate to him. Things like that are, might be a little bit of extra work, but if they're one time set up and there's something that the faculty member can learn, oh, it's already in there, I'll just search for it. I don't need to know all this, how to find an image, how to download, how to upload, all that stuff, it's just there. Um, there's a certain amount of preloading content that's very easy to do with WordPress. So. Yeah, and things like tags, it also builds in like the most used ones or if I start to type something and I'm not sure if it's in there or if it's a different version of the word, I can start to type it and it'll show me what the most recent ones were so it keeps people from making a huge mess of the site if they take their time with it. Any other questions? Um, would people like me to go into any other examples of what we've done with, or the basic WordPress setup? Would you like to see more of the WordPress backend? Okay. Um, I actually had the, the student worker created three. Um, let me go to... I'm doing this the roundabout way just because I want to show you how they've been. Okay, so here's the three ones that I had our student worker create, and you can see how often they've been downloaded. So the category import one is right there. That's what I use to actually add the categories all at once in one copy and paste function. And that into categories. Yeah, it does it in the right order. It does it in the right hierarchy. It has a preview function. So if you're copying and pasting a really long document and you're not sure you did it quite right, you can look at it first. Um, the FeedBurner FeedSmith Extend has the most downloads of the ones that he did because that was, um, FeedBurner's a website that started off when they were first doing all this RSS feed reader kind of big push um, when that technology was a big thing. Um, Google bought them out and there's still a service that's available and it's still a really helpful service, but there's a few things like the FeedBurner FeedSmith was a plugin that somebody wrote from FeedBurner and did not keep supporting. So it actually breaks with the newest version. I had my student worker figure out what was breaking and then add a bunch of other features so it could do things like automatically showing the email link. Um, so he created that and other people also wanted to use it and it was broken so they like it. Um, the bulk slug and description update, <laughs> one of our other staff members hates things titled slugs. Um, but uh, what that looks like, let me go back. That was the one that you could use to add either page numbers or more information like maybe links to ebook chapters or something like that. Um, these are the kinds of features that are built into WordPress but not every theme uses them so we've had to customize our theme to make it take advantage of some features that not everybody bothers with. This isn't a traditional blog but we're using built-in features because we don't want to mess around with any core code we just want to build on top of the possibilities. So. If I wanted to put in formatted HTML stuff to link to something or show an image or something like that, I can do that. Let me, 
uh, show you an example of a site that we're working on that's not. I love using WordPress for all kinds of things. Sometimes things it's not meant to do. Um, sometimes things it can do, but other people aren't doing. So for example, here's one where I added a description. This is actually using a tag instead of a category, but because I'm not making a hierarchy of our faculty, one is not above the other, they're all faculty. Um, but this includes an image from their faculty profile. It includes uh, formatted, you know, nice header, you know, different size fonts and links and so forth. And that's set up so that automatically every time we add something under this faculty member, that always shows at the top. So that's using a description. That's like pushing the category function a little bit farther. That's pushing this description thing. That if, you have, if you don't have these plugins, if you go to categories, you'll see that they have this thing here called description. But almost no themes use it for anything in particular. I just said, this is great. This is perfect for what I'm trying to do. I'm going to build it in. And then I can't find an easy way to edit it. I have to go to each one. No. I'm going to have a student worker write it. <laughs> so, and again, it's set up so that you can choose different types. So if you were using tags and you wanted to put something for, you know, an image, let's say an icon for, these are all PDFs. And I've said PDFs. And I want it to have a picture of PDFs at the top of the PDF page. Um, Fine, you can fiddle with it however you want to, whether you're using it for a function or whether you're using it to play with the design. Um, having some of these things that just make it easier to edit the back end, um, I think makes it easier to run the whole site. So. Yeah. So you can actually see on the, um, one thing I've used, the you can also edit the slugs there as one page. So if I was going to category, for instance, I can change those. Where that becomes useful is something like uh, the, um, the supplement site that I was showing you because we entered all of those things manually. A lot of times it wants to sort things um, and different things based on the order that you enter it. Again, kind of like a blog where the oldest thing you entered is at the bottom and the newest thing is at the top. Well, sometimes when you're doing organization, you want to customize the sorting order, like for a table of contents. You don't want it to automatically display it if you entered them manually and forgot one section and now, you know, you forgot section, chapter one, section B, and now it's always showing at the bottom and that's a huge pain in the neck. Um, and one other feature that's built in is that slug thing where you can customize what the link is up in the top. So if I go to, um, uh, let me see if I can change this here. Um, each of these little things here is technically a slug when it says chapter dash 15, even though, um, or chapter 15 B instead it, it shows when I look at it, B oil and gas development in the Peruvian Amazon. I didn't want that whole long chapter heading to be what shows up in the link, especially if somebody's sending this link to somebody else. And table of contents tend to have a lot of content um, that you don't want to show. Um, so something like that makes it easier to streamline the whole way that the site appears. And some of that can be just, you know, nitpicky. It may not be necessary. Um, and if it doesn't matter for what you're doing, it's not that important. I just like having easy ways to fiddle with it if I want to. So that's part of why I've really appreciate our student workers doing these things. Um, these sites could also be optimized for mobile if you had a mobile um, theme. I mentioned, and I can show this, I mentioned this in one of the sessions yesterday. Um, why am I adding www? We were playing with doing a mobile website for the library using WordPress. Um, and there's other themes that are out there. Some of them, it controls your whole site, and you wouldn't want this to be your casebook. But if there's a plugin that lets you check if it's mobile and then put a site like this, then it simplifies it. So if you're viewing it on an iPhone or you know, even a less complicated phone that doesn't have the kind of image resolution that an iPhone or any other smartphone would have. You can have designs that look okay. And it, you know, maybe it doesn't look great, but you can still see the information. So I like playing with WordPress. I think it's really easy 
to share with other people. I think it's easy to get to know the back end. Um, I really like the open source aspect. I like being able to have our work going out there and being used by other people. So that's part of why I did the presentation today. So I hope you'll let me know if it, this is something you've started experimenting with, if you have any ideas. Like I said, we do have other projects. We have to install our new library servers this summer. Uh, so I do not expect to be spending as much time with it after the presentation as I did before, but um, it is something that I'd like to see where it goes. So I've still got five minutes left. I'm open for questions. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Monkey. Oh, thank you. Oh, hold on. Yeah, that's okay. That's right. fine. Thank you. Um, in terms of, of using this stuff on Classcaster, um, there are. Um, it'd be really cool if people would like. If you don't have a local, ins uh, you know, local installation of WordPress, although you could bug your local IT department because I think every law school should be running WordPress now, just as a matter of course, because um, it's. It's easy. It's multi-user out of the box. It'll plug into your Active Directory. There's really not much of a reason, like, not to run it. But, um, but if they're not, Classcaster is available. Um, we, uh, uh, you know, uh, pretty much uh, Classcaster sites run the, the gamut from uh, library sites. Sue's here. She runs the library site. She runs a big library site, probably the most popular site on Classcaster at the moment. <laughs> um, uh, to uh, um, to uh, uh, course sites, um, informational stuff. Uh, we use it for marketing blogs. The podcast. Oh, yeah. Don't forget about the right and and podcasting. The, the one really cool feature. There's podcasting built into Classcaster. So if you've got if you have a telephone, I think most people have those, um, you can actually dial in a number and record podcasts and they'll, they'll show up on your blog. So that's, you, you, you a, can't, you, you could can't, have a Facebook podcast. You could, you could have a, pay, right, there's, um, you know, we, we uh, uh, you know, we have uh, a handful of, of faculty members who, who make, uh, you know, who make use of that feature. And it could even be a collection of lectures based on the casebook. <laughs> yes, it could. Um, and we're also looking at, um, there's a, uh, a plug-in called Anthologize for, class, uh, for WordPress that um, will take, uh, allow you to construct an e-book from your uh, WordPress blog. Um, so since I'm all about e-books <laughs> this year, um, yeah, we're, we're looking at that and, and that combined with, um, with some of the work that, that Emily and, and the folks at, at Kent have done um, would really uh, allow for the possibility to create a really great, uh, you know, casebook as a website uh, sort of, of thing that anybody could do, really. I mean, it's not, it, it's not the sort of thing that could, that, that could you know, just wind up being like a one-off project. And that's really what I designed this to be, is something that you don't have to know code to get started. And I hope that that's how it functions. <laughs> yes? I think it's the front thing. The, oh, it's... There you go. <laughs> Do I need to keep... Yeah, you have to hold it down. Oh, boy. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> sorry about that. So, class caster you can't use to create a mobile site, though. Or can you? You would talk... Talk to Elmer about the theme. Yes, yes, you can. There's, a, there's actually a, a plugin called uh, WP Touch, I yeah. think, that um, that does a really nice job of of, uh, of 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 refactoring your site to work on mobile platforms, um, and uh, and you don't have to do anything really beyond turning on the plugin. Here, let's test it. I will activate it, and anybody with a mobile device can now go to emilybarney.classcaster.net and see how well it works. <laughs> okay, so I have two minutes left, one minute on that clock. Any other questions that we want to have on the recording? Or that's all she wrote for now. <laughs> Well, thank you for coming, and I hope you'll keep in contact. <laughs>
Oh, one thing I wanted to mention was a lot of the images on my site were using um, a custom icon designs images, and I wanted I wanted to put a link, and I didn't get it up, so they're great. <laughs> if anybody likes um, using graphic design for free, I love Icon Archive because it'll let you see what the um, license is to use their images for illustrations. There's a lot of great stuff in there. <laughs>